It's my honor now to introduce Dr. Mark Ensalaco, an, an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Dayton. Professor Ensalaco served as the director of the International Studies Program from 1997 to 2006. His lengthy resume, of which I will just do excerpts, includes numerous human rights-related activities, many of them. 1998, he founded the Interdisciplinary Human Rights Studies Program, the first undergraduate program specifically concerned with human rights in the entire country. As a result, in 2007, the university's trustees formally approved, as many of you know, the creation of the nation's first Bachelor of Arts in Human Rights Studies, right here. Professor Ensalaco also co-founded the University Human Rights Committee, composed of faculty members from the Social Sciences, Humanities, and Law, and as chair of the Human Rights Committee, the professor helped organize major international conferences on such diverse subjects as human rights education, children's human rights, peace and human rights, transitional justice, violence against women, and torture. Professor Ensalaco's current work and advocacy concerns human trafficking. He is a member of the Coalition of Catholic Organizations Against Human Trafficking and is collaborating with a number of national and local organizations to develop a plan to end human trafficking and to assist trafficked persons in Ohio. Here to present the winner of the 2009 Dayton Literary Peace Prize for Nonfiction, Dr. Mark Ensalaco. <clears throat> Good evening. My, my apologies. I brought water because uh, <clears throat> I was uh, asked to be given uh, this great privilege of preventing, uh, presenting this award, and so I immediately lost my voice. My students will rejoice at that, I must, I must tell you. But this is serious business. Look, today, on every continent, traffickers buy and sell human beings and prosper from their enslavement. Human trafficking is an abomination. It's an offense against the dignity of the human person whom God created in his likeness and image. It is a violation of the most basic of human rights and the very existence of human trafficking diminish, diminishes all of us. And human trafficking is ubiquitous. Ben Skinner has taught us that. Ben Skinner has sought out slaves and slave traders on four continents and come face to face with them. And with his magnificent book, he has brought us face to face with them as well. You can read, as I have, the, the reports of the United Nations, the International Labor Organization, the State Department, the Justice Department, or any one of the myriad of human rights organizations that are dedicated to the abolition of modern day slavery. You can read those, and when you read them, you can begin to see the breadth of the global crime of human trafficking. But a crime so monstrous is different. A crime so monstrous compels us to peer into the depths of the depravity of the slave trade and the depths of the suffering of the slaves. Human trafficking is the modern name of an ancient evil. I, and I'm not alone in this, I find the phrase human trafficking to be misleading because it focuses on the transaction, the buying and selling of human beings rather than on the cruel, soul-crushing reality of enslavement. Trafficking is slavery. <clears throat> and Ben Skinner has revealed this in this magnificent book. His book is morally compelling. It compels us to acknowledge that we as individuals and all institutions of society have a moral responsibility to end trafficking and to free captives from forced labor or commercial sex. It compels us to acknowledge that we must end trafficking and free the captives simply because it is in our power to do so. We can end modern day slavery, but only if we commit ourselves to that common moral purpose. A crime so monstrous does this. It stirs the conscience of society to action against trafficking and slavery. That is its power and that is its purpose. Human trafficking is a global evil which we must confront beginning here in our local community. Ben Skinner came face to face with slaves and slavers in distant places that few of us will ever visit. 
but we know that there are slaves in America as well. Just last week, the FBI announced Operation Cross Country 4. The Bureau arrested modern day slave traders in three dozen American cities, including Toledo and Columbus, and freed scores of sex slaves. Many of them were children. The youngest in Ohio was just 10 years of age. The enslavement of human beings in the commercial sex industry is an abomination, but we must never lose sight of the fact that millions of human beings are forced to work under the threat of violence with no pay in sweatshops, migrant labor camps, and in households as well around the world and in America. One of the great merits of a crime so monstrous is that the book reminds us of the pervasiveness of forced labor and argues against the myopic attention to forced prostitution alone. Look, I can't say enough about this book or its author, the courage it took to research it, the elegance of the writing. It is a masterful, it's a beautiful book, albeit about an ugly topic. But you will not find this book's merit only in the quality of the research or the writing. This, book pow this book's power comes from the moral vision of its author. A crime so monstrous will have an enduring legacy. I can imagine a conversation years from now with someone who has dedicated himself or herself to the new abolitionist movement that is just now beginning to gather momentum. And I will ask, when did you become involved in the abolitionist movement? Why did you become involved? And he or she will answer, because I read A Crime So Monstrous. Ben Skinner's book calls our attention to a monstrous crime, certainly. But more than that, it summons us to a common moral purpose and trafficking, free the captives. This is what distinguishes a crime so monstrous. The Dayton Literary Peace Prize. This is not merely an award for a superb piece of nonfiction literature, although a crime so monstrous is certainly that. Right? Rather, this is a literary peace prize. Ben Skinner is profoundly deserving of a peace prize because this book, A Crime So Monstrous, has injected adrenaline into the bloodstream of the movement to abolish slavery and to bring peace to the tormented lives of tens of millions of slaves who may live among us. Ben, I congratulate you for this award. It's richly deserved. But more than that, in the name of all of us who work in abolition, and more importantly, in the name of all the slaves, I thank you for this book. So it's my privilege to present the 2009 Dayton Literary Peace Prize to Benjamin Skinner. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is a, um, this is a tremendous honor. Um, I, you might have noticed me putting a phone back here. My, my parents couldn't be with us tonight, unfortunately. My, my father turns 88 next week, and there was a minor health crisis last week. He's, he's doing OK. But unfortunately, they, they couldn't make the trip. But they're joining all of you by speakerphone at the moment. So be nice. <laughs> I, I want to thank uh, Mark so much for that, for that very generous introduction. Um, the, the highest praise that, that I can receive for, for this book is, is truly the, the idea that I could motivate one journalist, one scholar, one doctor, one engineer to get involved and to dedicate themselves to this. So thank you so much for, for, the, for the hope and the, the optimism that I may have accomplished that. Um, the, uh, I, I particularly, of course, want to thank the, the committee and especially the, the early readers, several of whom are, are in attendance. Um, uh, you took a chance with this book. I recognize that. Um, I, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Nick Clooney so much. I, I don't know if this has been mentioned yet, but thank you so much for your work on Sudan. Um, it makes a great difference. It makes a great difference. The, um, the co-chairs of the event, uh, Mark Meister and, and Sharon Rabb as well, uh, thank you so much for providing a, a great uh, second, third, fourth home in here in Dayton. Um, Dayton, which has always held a rather mystical quality uh, for me, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, the, the other winners that I'm being honored with here, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to stand next to them, uh, to Richard and uh, to Nick, 
uh, Nick in particular, who has been a, an inspiration to me and so many other journalists, who, who by his example has shown that it is, it is possible to make a career in this field doing good uh, and, and, and pushing for, for others to do more than ponder over the deeds of darkness, but actually to fight them. Um, uh, it's, it's an honor to be listed as well among the other, among the other uh, finalists, uh, uh, Nicholson Baker, uh, Joan Baxter, David Grossman, uh, Ariel Sabar, and uh, my, my old boss's friend Strobe Talbot, um, and of course uh, Thomas Friedman. Uh, in, in, that, in that crowd, I really didn't think that I had a bat's chance in hell. Uh, <laughs> But I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for the fact that you you took a chance on me, and and uh, decided to highlight uh, this this issue of modern day slavery with with three out of the out of the five honorees this evening. Um, uh, in particular, I, I do want to thank two people who I had dearly hoped would be here. Uh, those are my folks. They have um, gone through a lot over the last ten years. Uh, not the least of which is my uh, putting on hold a uh, family, which is uh, uh, no mere sacrifice, I know, for, for my mother in particular. I'm an only child, uh, and she wants grandkids. Um, uh, but um, as somebody once said, I, I am what you made me. I hope, I hope you're happy. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, this is... This is my, uh, my, my first literary prize, but it's actually my, uh, my second uh, uh, peace prize. When I, when I was in third grade, um, <laughs> my third grade teacher um, honored me in front of the, the whole class of 30 kids. Um, uh, everybody actually, to be honest, got a prize. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the, this is very much, you know, um, new age public education, um, and and the, the the prize with which I was honored uh, was for being nice to everybody, for being a peace person, um, and I was I was a little bit honestly ashamed of that because it seemed wimpy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, was, uh, it seemed wimpy. You know, the the other kids got soccer, best soccer player, uh, best athlete overall, fastest in class, you know, uh, most popular, uh, and I got peace person. Um, but I took it. I took it home, and I sort of sheepishly handed it to my to my mother. And and um, my mother raised me Quaker. Um, Quakers were, are pacifists, and they were, including my ancestors, among the original abolitionists, and they certainly enshrine and hold dear peace. Um, and I, I can remember about 10 years after that, I went into my mother's office uh, uh, at, her, at her job at the University of Wisconsin, and there by the, by the entrance was this framed certificate, peace person that I'd won in third grade. And it meant, it meant a great deal to me. She, she trained me and she, she pressed me to, to believe and to work for peace, to believe and to work for social justice, and to sacrifice. And I was raised, in, as I say, in the Quaker tradition, which is very much an abolitionist tradition. The Quakers believed that the divine spirit, the divine spark, animates every man. And uh, as such, the, the traffic in men body, slavery, was an abomination. And to work for its eradication was to work for peace. And so I thank the, the committee so much for, for recognizing the centrality of the abolition of slavery to any lasting peace in this world. Um, in addition, I, I, I want to I want to say a word about one person who's not here, who I know is deeply honored by his uh, affiliation with with Dayton, and that is Ambassador Holbrook, uh, who who graced the book with uh, forward, um, and who uh, for whom Dayton holds a very dear place in his heart. Uh, Dayton has always held a, a mystical quality for me because I worked for Ambassador Holbrook for four years and so it was always this, this place where you accomplish 
the impossible. It's, it's the place where man takes flight. It's the place where intractable conflicts are resolved and peace is brought in impossible situations. Um, for me, I hope it is also the place where we further the movement to, to end what has been a 5,000 year old crime, but what is not impossible to end in a generation, and that is modern day slavery. Uh, very briefly, uh, when I'm talking about slavery, I want to be absolutely clear, as Mark so well laid out, what it is that we're talking about. Because the, the term has become devalued in, in modern life. If you look up in Merriam-Webster dictionary today, the term slavery, the, the first definition is drudgery or toil. Uh, about a year ago, I was on a flight coming back from Hong Kong. And the, uh, it was an overnight flight. I had a speech the next day. And I had a very talkative um, young woman next to me. Um, and she asked me what I did for a living. And I needed to get some sleep. And so I said, well, I'm a specialist in uh, mass atrocities in modern day slavery and child rape. And that usually ends the conversation right there. Uh, in this particular instance, she said, slavery, I, I, I know something about this. I, I'm, a, I'm a banker and I, I have two mortgages. Um, you know, I, I, I have to maintain my, my, uh, my income levels, otherwise I fall into debt and, and uh, you know, I'm trapped in these jobs. And I said, well, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about is a little bit different. The people that I'm talking about are in the eyes of their employers uh, disposable. And uh, this, was, this was actually shortly after the collapse of, uh, of the financial markets. And she says, well, do you know anybody that works for Lehman Brothers? Uh, and I said, uh, actually, one of my close friends does. And I said, OK, well, this is going to be a longer conversation. And I wound up not getting that, uh, that much sleep that night. But I hope uh, I made a convert. And I hope I, I make a couple here this evening. What I'm talking about, when I use the term slave, is I am talking about people who are forced to work, held through fraud, under threat of violence, for no pay beyond subsistence. And in the world today, according to the International Labor Office, according to the United Nations, there are somewhere between 12 and 27 million people forced to work, held through fraud, under threat of violence, for no pay beyond subsistence. That's more slaves on Earth today than at any point in human history, whether you take the high end or the low end number there. Um, the numbers can be numbing. So I tried to break it down, and I tried to look at where these slaves are. There are between 10 and 20 million that are held in debt bondage, in, in what the, the UN in its deathless prose <laughs> refers to as generational, hereditary, collateralized, debt bondage, uh, which in no way reveals the horror of a man, a woman, a child who is forced to work breaking rocks, who is beaten regularly, who cannot walk away, who is, uh, in the case of the women and girls, raped in order to, in order to coerce the men back uh, into the quarry, and, and who does all of this on the basis of a debt that in some cases is as little as I found of 62 cents taken three generations earlier. Uh, this, this, uh, this term, slavery, has real meaning for millions of people in the world today. And so what I wanted to do, what I set out to do with this book is to find real slaves, to find real traffickers and to find real abolitionists, those few who worked diligently to, to fight slavery and to free slaves. And I'll talk about them in a second. But first, I, I want to relay a, relate a story. Because I dedicated the book to my parents who deserve it. Um, I would like to dedicate this award very much to those slaves and those survivors who took the chance and spoke with me. Uh, and as uh, Nick Kristoff was speaking about so eloquently this morning, that chance is, in many cases, putting themselves in mortal danger, and I recognize that. But I want to talk very briefly about somebody who, 
for um, reasons larger than herself, is no longer in jeopardy at the moment. Um, and this was, uh, I, I've continued to write on modern day slavery, encouraged um, uh, largely to awards like this, to recognition and, and to, the, to the hope that what I do makes a difference and encourages others to pick up this fight and to join the movement. But I was in South Africa this uh, summer on assignment for Time, Time Magazine. And a, uh, I was specifically focused around the World Cup stadiums. As, as most of you know, the World Cup will take place in South Africa and the major cities of South Africa next year. And I was interested in looking at sex trafficking around the World Cup stadiums. And one night, I began the night, it was a freezing cold night in, in July, of course it's winter down there, um, in a state-run hospital with no central heating um, at the bedside of a young woman uh, named Sindiswa. And actually this wasn't a hospital. She had been checked out a week earlier and this was a hospice. She was 17 years old. She had been sold into a Nigerian human trafficking network with her best friend uh, a week, uh, sorry, a month, a year and a half earlier. And the, uh, the condition that she, that I found her in led me to believe that I would probably be the first uh, and the last person to take her story. And so I took it very seriously as I always do talking to survivors. And she had full-blown AIDS. She had tuberculosis and, um, and she was three months pregnant. She had been sold for the equivalent of $35 and a bag of crack provided to her recruiter. And through halting breaths, she told me her story and afterwards I said, is there anything else that you would want readers to know about your life? And she just said, thank you. Thank you for caring about my story. And I told her, it. It, it is a privilege, and it truly is a privilege. It was a privilege to hear her story, it's a privilege to be before you today, and it's a privilege to work for human rights. The, the, the night ended up, um, I, I, I don't wanna reveal the whole story as my editor at uh, Time Magazine would have me killed probably if I did. It comes out later on this month, you can all pick it up. Um, but the night, uh, went on and I uh, eventually found her trafficker uh, and I found a young woman um, who I, I, I saw, uh, my photographer was taking a picture of, uh, of a hotel that had been taken over by, uh, by a number of Nigerian syndicates and it was about one in the morning and as she was shooting there was a girl standing in the corner uh, and this girl was wearing a, a red hood. She stood out, um, uh, and she was wearing open-toed shoes, and it was, it was zero degrees out that night. It was freezing. And I went over to her, and I said a few words, and she spoke just enough English to tell me that she was 15 years old. She had been sold uh, into a Nigerian network, um, and uh, she came from Eastern Cape. And I put two and two together, and I realized that this was the best friend of the young woman that I had been interviewing, whose life story I'd been taking earlier that night in the hospice. And this young woman, this girl, um, wanted to get out. She was desperate to leave. And so uh, after a, a series of fairly harrowing events that, I'll uh, that I do describe in the, in the Time Magazine story, then again, I'll, I'll, retain, um, I'll retain some suspense there we got her out. I was keenly aware, A, that I'd crossed a line as a journalist and gotten involved in one young woman's life. It wasn't the first time I'd done it, it was actually the second time I'd done it. Um, and in both instances, I recognized that emancipation was not the last step. In this country, we liberated between three and four million slaves uh, thanks, to the, um, thanks to the American Civil War. My, my ancestors, um, my great-great-grandfather fought with Grant's army at the siege of Petersburg. 
and 360,000 of his brothers in the, in the Union Army never, never came home. But when we did emancipation then, we dumped through between three and four million slaves on the economy with, with no comprehensive rehabilitation, with no access to credit, and with no sense of themselves in the American economy beyond their mere, their mere use as tools. Some made it, others didn't, but one way or another, we're paying the price for that botched emancipation 150 years later. In this one instance, with this one girl, I knew that I had to do emancipation right. I took on a responsibility by getting involved in her life. And I found a, a lovely uh, Chicago couple um, who are actually the uh, the parents of my girlfriend, Allie, who's here with me today, thank you, Allie, for coming, um, who took on this responsibility with me, who agreed to sponsor her school. I found a terrific social worker in her home district who agreed to monitor her and to, to make sure that she, she stays safe, fed, in school, and most importantly, free. And the updates that I have are that she is thriving. She's HIV negative. She survived. It would be a stretch to call her lucky, but she has another chance at life. And I'm keenly aware of the dozens that I met and the millions that I haven't met who don't have that chance yet. They are still enslaved unless we act. So I asked the question somewhat rhetorically, massively rhetorically, what good is, what good is this award? I, I'm reminded of a 25-year-old who in the year 1785 was given uh, an award for his writing on modern day slavery, or sorry, of what was then modern day slavery, um, what was what we now call slavery in antiquity. He was, a, he was a divinity student at Cambridge and he'd entered a Latin essay competition with one goal, as he put it, to gain literary honor. That was it. But reading the records of slave ship captains and learning about the monstrosity of slavery in his time Thomas Clarkson became activated and he, he stepped up and with the aid of a parliamentarian, the great parliamentarian William Wilberforce, within 20 years he had stopped a trade that was equivalent in size today to the American, to the, to the worldwide automobile industry. This was a tremendous accomplishment and it began with a literary prize. I don't forget that. <laughs> So with this, with this prize, and again, I am so deeply honored to be, to be part of it, um, and I am humbled to be in the, in, the, in the presence of the other winners, and I am grateful for the fact that three out of the five winners have focused, have focused their works on, on modern day slavery, which I believe is the great human rights challenge of our generation. I, I'm also, profoundly privileged to be able to donate this prize to a group called Free the Slaves, which is the American wing of that group that was founded by William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson, Anti-Slavery International, what was then known as the Anti-Slavery Society. They have the, the, the best programs that I've seen worldwide to not only free slaves, but to do emancipation right and to comprehensively rehabilitate slaves. Uh, as this is, this prize in particular will go to uh, a new program that they've begun after several years of, of prep work in northern India. They've identified 16 villages, uh, each containing between 15 and 25 families, all of them in debt bondage, forced to work under threat of violence for no pay beyond subsistence. 
to comprehensively rehab free and rehabilitate these individuals to provide them with, with legal representation, to provide them with economic benefits, a basket of social and economic benefits, to allow them to demand their own freedom and to, to, to cause this upward spiral of development and what free the slaves cause a freedom dividend uh, costs about $10,000 per year. So the first village and the first year is thanks to all of you. Thank you so much for this honor and, and thank you for, for being a part of the fight against modern day slavery. Let his folks hear it. <laughs>